All right, so what I thought I would uh, share with you guys today is a, a, what I call a, a, a few random proverbs. Um, those of you who are in my classes know I don't like to sit still, so I'll probably just walk around, just don't pay attention. I just got to do that to keep my, myself interested. Um, hopefully, uh, it'll be interesting to, to, to you as well. The first proverb I want to share with you um, is Die dümmsten Bauern ernten die dicksten Kartoffeln. And uh, those of you who speak German would know, you know, this means literally the, the stupid farmers uh, harvest the biggest potatoes. Um, this quote comes from uh, when I was uh, in high school. I took three years of German, and uh, Frau Albrecht, who was my, uh, my German teacher, uh, had instilled in me a, a love of, of German and the German people. And so when I went to, uh, to BYU to do my undergraduate study, um, I took Das Buch Mormon with me, and you studied, you know, every morning I'd read my Book of Mormon in German. And uh, when people would ask me, where, where do you want to go on your mission? I said, well, I don't care wherever the Lord calls me as long as it's East Germany. Uh, so I, uh, you can imagine my surprise when I uh, steamed open my uh, mission call with, uh, with all of my uh, roommates. And uh, the intent was to change my mission call from East Germany to uh, Sacramento, California, where I lived at the time, and then send it to my parents as a joke. Um, so I steamed open the letter, opened it up, and on it said, Seoul, Korea. And I was like, that's not part of the plan. Um, many of you probably who have opened your own mission calls maybe felt the similar way I did. I, I really had a hard time knowing where Korea was on a map and uh, let alone uh, being able to, uh, to, to go there. Um, so I prayed, got myself excited, went to the MTC, and uh, instead of, um, you know, SYLing in, in Korean, I would go on the lunch lines and I would uh, speak German with the German missionaries uh, because I felt that, uh, you know, they'd made a mistake and they were probably going to change my call while I was in the MTC because I, I knew that uh, I was supposed to go to Germany. Um, well, that, that didn't happen and uh, there were some, some, uh, some very special experiences that happened while I was there that revealed to me um, that uh, the Lord had something else in mind for me. Um, so when I arrived in Korea, I was very similar to this, uh, this proverb we say in Korea, which is ulmian uh, keguri. Um, also translated literally as a frog in a well. Uh, my view of the world was very narrow. Uh, when I was thinking about, you know, what I had to do in, in life and what I wanted to do in my future, um, it, it didn't have to do much with anything outside of California and, and Utah where I was going to school. Uh, but at that point, um, my, my mind began to, uh, to, to be uh, expanded and broadened. And uh, I decided that uh, there was more to life beyond uh, Utah and uh, school. And like many of you um, who have, uh, have gone on missions, uh, you know, began to become aware that it was more than just myself. Uh, and when, when being able to serve people was, was something that was a, a very special experience for me. So little did I know at that time that that mission to Korea would lead to over 18 years uh, of my career uh, in and out of Asia. Um, let me go back for a second, and, and uh, when I was in, on my mission, I had set up a, an opportunity um, for a producer uh, to go to KBYU uh, on an internship, a producer I was teaching at the time. And uh, when I returned to BYU, I got an invitation um, from the television studio there to, to return to Korea to be a television reporter. And so I decided at that time that, you know, I could probably 
go with independent study and some of the other options I had at the point, and uh, with some internship credits, I uh, returned to Korea and was a television reporter on, uh, on NBC and, uh, uh, for, for about 18 months. At that time, I think I was one of the first uh, foreigners speaking Korean on, on the uh, Korean television sta station. And now we have uh, several, many of those who are, are return missionaries. Um, but through that experience, uh, my mind began to even broaden further beyond the, the mission experience. Um, my job was to host a video magazine in which I would tour Korea and, and go and, and do different things with different people experiencing the culture and the customs and then uh, do a report on whatever unique things I was, I was able to find. Well, my flagship program was to go and be a, a fisherman with the Korean, some Korean fishermen out on the east coast of Korea, on the East Sea. That day was particularly uh, rough on the seas, and so I noticed all of my camera crew putting these patches behind their ears. And I was wondering, you know, hey, don't I need one of those as well? And they're like, oh, no, no, you'll be fine. So we went out, and they put me underneath the boat, and I slept with the fishermen as we went out to sea to, 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 to get, get to where the nets were. Um, and about an hour later, I woke up, and I didn't feel so good. Uh, the, the, rough, the seas were extremely rough, and uh, I clearly was, uh, did not have uh, my sea legs. So immediately the camera crew said, okay, you know, we got to get started, start reporting. So my, I put on the, the fisherman gear and was out there with the fishermen trying to figure out what their life was like while I was just not feeling well, pulling in, you know, these, these nets. And uh, we caught some fish, and I was able to, to, to keep most of my, my, my whereabouts. But then the fishermen sliced open the fish right there, and... In Korean, when we had hey, we just have like basically sushi or sashimi right there on the on the ship while the ship's going this. And after having the sashimi with, or the 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 hey, which actually wasn't that bad, my stomach couldn't handle it anymore, and I you know proceeded to uh, to to return the fish to the ocean over the side of the boat. Um, so I came back. It was a very interesting first experience, and um, uh, the television studio started promoting uh, this, this new video program. Um, I was pretty excited. I was telling all of my friends and, you know, that, hey, this is coming out on national TV the, the, the next week. Little did I know that there was a promotion that was running every hour on national television. And that promotion was a close-up of me vomiting over the side of the boat on Korean national TV as the trailer to get everybody interested in uh, watching uh, the television's, the, uh, the video magazine show. Luckily for you, I couldn't find the clips uh, in my garage uh, in boxes, but uh, uh, it's probably better that I didn't show that. Um, so, Skip forward, 18 months after uh, being, uh, uh, going back to BYU and being an undergraduate there, um, I was studying human biology. I was in a uh, microbiology lab. Uh, I knew that my calling was to be a doctor, and so I, I took the MCAT and uh, got accepted to medical school. Um, ever since I had remembered, I, I knew that I wanted to be a doctor, and so um, at least after playing professional baseball, I wanted to become a doctor, and we can, we'll talk more about that later. Um, around this time, I also met my, my future wife, and you can imagine her shock uh, when on our first date, I randomly said, hey, you know, would you ever live in Korea? Um, not usually the first you know, question you ask a girl that you're out on a date with. Uh, I would not suggest that for those of you who want dating advice. Um, but uh, surprisingly to me, um, she thought about a second and said, sure. Uh, little did I know that she had lived half of her life outside of the, uh, the mainland, uh, growing up in Brazil and in Portugal. Um, so there was a, a, a very unique and fortuitous match for me uh, going forward to what I did later in life. 
Um, while I was, after taking the MCAT and, and going through the, uh, the rounds of, uh, of interviewing and being accepted to medical school, out of the blue, I got an offer to return to Korea uh, to, to help a company open up its, uh, its facilities there. Um, and uh, this had come through the connections I had made as a television reporter. We had, we had started a consulting business and we're, we're helping a few companies here and there on the side. Um, but this, this, this connection turned out to, to, to turn into a job. Um, I thought about it for a moment and thought, well, I can go to medical school and get in debt or I can go and do this for a year and maybe pay for medical school. So I decided that I would defer medical school and go back to Korea uh, with my, my new bride and uh, have an experience uh, opening this company back in Korea. Um, so this decision kind of sums up another proverb uh, that I'd, I'd like to share with you, and I think it's... Uh, uh, best uh, told by one of uh, the most famous Chinese and uh, uh, many of the Chinese heroes, uh, Bruce Lee. So hopefully this will come across. We have the, 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 the volume up. Let's see here. All right, so be water, my friends. And what that meant to me uh, was something that I, I, I picked up on later when I was in China, a shui da xin, and shui da xin, or a water heart, literally means to have a malleable heart, to be flexible. And I found this was, was valuable in my career as well as my personal life. Um, Jeremiah, when he was talking about the, the potter's clay and the potter noticing the crack. Excellent. This is the second time this has happened to me on campus. I'm going to do this. Should I, should I just go for it? All right. So, once again, being flexible. Uh, too much power in the room. We... Uh, in being flexible, uh, in talking about Jeremiah and the potter's clay, Jeremiah in the Bible talks about the pot and the clay pot and having a crack. And when the potter is forming this pot on the, uh, I forgot what, the, the wheel, um, if he notices a crack, he can take clay that is malleable and easily reform the pot. However, if that pot is brittle and unwilling or dried out and is unwilling to be malleable, he'll have to break the pot and throw it away. So I found that uh, this ability to be flexible, to be malleable, to have a broken heart is, uh, has, been, has uh, played out well for me. So I need to restart this. Maybe is there a power, uh, master power switch down below? All right. Um, after Korea, my wife and I later ended up in Malaysia, where I was responsible for uh, growing a business across Southeast Asia, which included Singapore and uh, Brunei and Indonesia. Uh, during this time, my wife was expecting our first child. Um, and uh, after we had been there for a while, got the business growing, um, it was a pretty exciting time for me. I enjoyed it a lot. But my company back in the United States had just been purchased by a, a New York investment group. And uh, I don't know if any of you have been, been working with many with New, New York investment bankers such as Brother Watson. Uh, but they can be quite ruthless. 
And so when they came in, they had the idea that they wanted to take the company public. And in order to do that, they decided to get rid of most of the executives. I got caught up in this. And two weeks before Christmas, with a wife that was nearly eight months pregnant, I was told that I had no job and that I'd have to return to the United States and, uh, you know, basically fend for myself. So I had no networks in the United States. All my networks were in Asia. I'd been working there for, for some time now. I had no job and uh, no house and a pregnant wife around Christmas. So I kind of felt like Joseph did, except it was my kid at this time. But uh, <laughs> I, <laughs> So I wasn't quite as, as uh, great as Joseph, not saying I was even close to that. But I, that Christmas was a little bit special for me. Um, so when I turned back, you know, uh, we had a decision to make. I was given a small severance, which basically was the end of my salary for that remaining month. And uh, do we pay tithing or not? Um, you know, we knew that the money was not going to last that long. And so we made a decision that we were going to put the Lord first and, and pay tithing, even though we, we didn't have enough money for Christmas and didn't have enough money to pay out for uh, medical insurance for the baby. Um, this was a definitely a trial of our faith, but my wife, who is much better than I, was definitely a rock in that decision, and, and together we decided to, to do that. While my wife was going through some of the boxes uh, that we had left in the States um, in, in her parents' garage, she found a couple of brand new shoes still in their, uh, their, their boxes. These were, for you those of your women, they were Ferragamo shoes. Now, those of you who know anything about shoes know Ferragamos are pretty expensive shoes, and they were given to her as a gift. But because they were brand new, unopened, still in the box, she was able to take those back to the store and get, get money for those, and that's what we used to pay for our medical insurance and to, to pay for a few gifts in, in Christmas that year. So um, the miracle of the shoes is a pretty big thing in our, in our, in our home during, around Christmas time. Um, but I still was faced with a problem. I had many, you know, going through the job thing, trying to find out where am I going to get a job. I have a new baby, a new baby son now. Um, I have no idea where, what I should do. And so uh, my, our grandma Bangader came up to me and said, you know, um, McDonald's is hiring and they have a really good management program I hear. And so uh, that was quite a, quite a shock to me. Um, I guess I was grateful that Grandma was trying to help. But at that point, uh, I could see that, that uh, there was a difference in her evaluation of my career possibilities and my own. Um, which kind of led me to the next quote and the next proverb that I learned while I was in Malaysia. So it's, So, air at the Sikhang, Didak Ankan Putis. Which means, basically, water that is being chopped will not be cut. Um, I think the best quote that describes how I felt at that time and how this, this uh, proverb mean, means to me comes um, from, a, from another uh, actor, I guess you could say. Uh, some of you probably are familiar with, with Rocky. And uh, this is one of the more recent films. But I think he kind of sums it up when he's giving some advice to his son. He's a washed up, well, an ex-fighter. And he's trying to give his son a lesson in life. And, and, and this, is, this is what he told his son. If we can get the power going. Well, it's not this volume. It's got to be that volume. All right. And... Uh, Probably Chris is the only one that can understand what he's saying now. It's good. It was really good. All right, why is the power outage to blow out our speakers. 
This is this is back on. Good old Rocky. Um, I took that advice in my own life and decided not to take the, uh, the manager position at McDonald's. But it kind of went back to a little bit before that. We're going to flash back to high school again. In high school, uh, when I was the uh, quarterback for our football team, um, I was sacked and I dislocated my shoulder. Um, Rather than giving up, I came back and I had to wear this brace, which kept my shoulder in place. Um, was very, very painful though to, to, to throw the ball. Um, several years later, um, I was a pitcher at the BYU baseball team, and uh, the orthopedic surgeon um, was shocked as he was examining me on the uh, the table as I was expressing I had some 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 pain in my shoulder. He said, with this shoulder, you have no business throwing a baseball, let alone at nearly 90 miles an hour. And he says, we, you need surgery immediately. Um, your shoulder's about to fall apart. And uh, right then and there, on the table, my dreams of uh, playing professional baseball, wasn't that good, but I, I thought it was, uh, was, uh, was dashed. Um, so... I hung up my cleats and uh, decided that I was going to go to medical school, and that was my calling instead. And uh, now you guys know how that, that turned out as well. So uh, getting back to, to taking some hits, you know, life really isn't about, about uh, getting hit and taking hits. It's about staying and keeping going, staying going forward. And you're in your careers. Many of you right now are studying something that you perhaps hopefully like and enjoy. But the chances are that many of you are going to end up in careers or, or opportunities that have nothing to do with what you're doing right now. The key is not give up, but to take the hits and to keep moving. Be malleable. Be able to understand that maybe there's a bigger, play, bigger uh, force at play in your life. So uh, going back to the unemployment, you know, uh, this definitely put me in a position where I was more malleable, threw some pride off, and uh, at one, one time, uh, you know, I, I was feeling pretty down, and, uh, but continuing to go to the temple, continuing to stay focused on what was important in life, um, I got some inspiration to go to a job fair at BYU. Um, hadn't been back to the campus for many years, head back, and uh, didn't see anything that was interesting, but I did find one table with one person who said that they were looking to, 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 to hire uh, in, in Asia. So I gave my resume, and they said, you know, I wouldn't expect much, but maybe we'll get back to you. That resume uh, led to a job where I was... Uh, uh, hired as a general manager for business development for a supply chain management company based in Hong Kong, where I was then, with my family, sent to the Philippines to, to start uh, an entirely new business. Um, take the hits and be flexible. Um, the reason why I was hired by, for this job with that I decided while I was in Malaysia on the side to go ahead and get a master's in international uh, marketing. 
what this had done for me had put me in a position where I was qualified to be able to take the job and at least get through the initial uh, screening process of the human resources people. That small investment turned out to, to provide this opportunity for me. Um, while I was later in uh, Taiwan, going forward several years, I was working for a company called Intel at that time. And uh, an opportunity came up in which uh, I was able uh, to, uh, to participate in a pilot program with Thunderbird, which is the number one international uh, MBA program uh, in the world. And while this opportunity came forward, I found out it was going to be extremely expensive because I was going to have to take it with some CEOs and executives within Taiwan, and they were going to fly the professors and us back and forth to Arizona. I didn't have the money or the, the ability to do it at that time, but decided that I would go ahead and apply and see what happened. I was accepted, surprisingly, even though I was 15 years younger than the youngest person in the class. While I was accepted, uh, I went to Intel and said, I, you know, I was hoping that I would be able to, to do this program. Would they be able to give me some time off? And my manager came forward and says, actually, we can actually probably pay for that on, on a few conditions. So they came around and they, they said that they were going to be able to pay for my education. So I went forward and, 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 and uh, began my MBA program. Halfway through, Intel began to lay off people. And they reneged on the... The, the condition of, of, of paying for my education, give, saying, stating the fact that we can't lay off people and pay for your education, we're, we're not going to be able to do this. And so I was stuck with a huge bill in which I was required to not only you know, pay for education going forward, but pay the back payment of, of all the, uh, the education I had taken to that point. Um, that was quite a sum of money. It was a lot higher than a normal MBA program, let alone you know, anything that we had in the bank at the time. Um, but my wife, um, in her wisdom, she came across this quote from Benjamin Franklin. It says, if a man empties his purse into his head, no man can take it from him. An investment in knowledge always pays the best interest. And so she felt that we should sell some of our investments, and uh, take all the money that we had in the bank and, and pay for the, for the education. And she felt that that was going to be a, a good investment for us. Um, some years later, while I was still at Intel, I was offered the job as the Chief Procurement Officer at Varian. And you can imagine my surprise when my signing bonus was exactly the amount that I had invested in my MBA program at Thunderbird. So my wife's fortuitous uh, inspiration, um, once again, um, had come to, to be fulfilled in our lives. Um, and uh, that's what I learned um, from, from that experience, was uh, definitely that whenever you have an opportunity, wherever you are, invest in your education. That can come in many forms. Um, if you're given an opportunity to be on a team and there's no extra pay, I get frustrated when I see some of my own staff or uh, people who are you know, just learning, starting in their careers, and they say, well, if I'm not going to get paid for it, you know, I'm not really interested. I think that's a big, big mistake. Whenever you have an opportunity to get education or experience or school, if you can take it, I would, I would strongly suggest that you, you, you go after it. It's at least turned out for me. Um, so, some of you may be questioning, well, you know, he was a CPO for Varian. We were living in Shanghai, um, you know, working for a $1 billion company, uh, had a staff of over 100, we had car, driver, maids, all those things in Shanghai, why would you come and uh, teach at BYU? Um, well, early last year, I was hosting a supply chain case competition here. Some of you might have still been here at the, at the time. 
And while I was speaking to the students, uh, one of the gurus and world-renowned experts in supply chain management came into the room. His name happens to be, uh, to you guys, known as uh, President Wheelwright. And while he was watching uh, the presentation, he mentioned to uh, some of the staff in the room that, hey, you know, maybe we should look into uh, to having him teach here sometime. So afterwards, I went and talked to him, and he convinced me to, to fill out a resume uh, in a, one of the application forms. I said, I'm really happy where I am, so I, I don't think I'll be coming here to teach anytime soon. But, uh, you know, I'll, I'll fill out the form in hopes that someday in the future um, that I'll be able to uh, retire and come to BYU-Hawaii and teach um, just like some of our other seasoned faculty who are here um, have done. Uh, we are lucky to, to have that experience, and I don't think that uh, I was even close to the level of, um, of experience, let alone gray hairs, as uh, some of our other faculty that are here who have much more experience and are much, much more, uh, in my opinion, esteemed than, than I, I was. So when I turned to Shanghai, um, after putting in this uh, uh, job application, um, my company, Varian, was bought by Agilent in one of the largest uh, mergers on, on NASDAQ at the time, a $1.5 billion deal in cash. This company paid a huge premium to buy our company um, and succinctly uh, let go all the executives. It seemed like I had been through this before. And so the company came in, basically said, you know, thank you for your work at Varian. You have no, you know, uh, here's, here's a little uh, parting gift and uh, thank you for playing. Um, I had several months to decide what I was supposed to do. I did have several job offers back in the States, uh, luckily within the industry. But at that point in time, BYU called me again and said, we have an opening in the supply chain and operations uh, position. Teaching at BYU would be interested. Um, that struck me, and I felt, I felt very interested to come back here uh, for, for many reasons, including I had an impression that this is where I was supposed to go. My wife was not so sure. Uh, she thought that uh, this was not necessarily the best career choice, and several of my colleagues within the industry also felt that I was crazy for, for deciding to, uh, to throw away at my, in their opinions, was what the pinnacle of my career to, to, to come and teach at BYU. Um, so before coming here for the interview, my wife was praying and fasting and uh, trying to uh, convince herself um, if, you know, was this the right decision or not. And while she was doing that, she decided to pray and then open up her scriptures and see what the Lord had an answer for her. And this is what she came, uh, what she found in the scriptures. If I can get this to start. There we go. She walked, turned to DNC 119. And this is, the, this is the verses she turned to. It says, Let the residue continue to preach from that hour, and if they do this in the lowliness of heart, and meekness and healing and long suffering, I, the Lord, will give them the promise that I will provide for their families, an effectual door shall be opened for them from henceforth. And next spring, let them depart. We were, our interview was in spring. To go across over the great waters, and there promulgate my gospel, the fullness thereof, and bear record of my name. At that point, the Spirit hit her, and she knew that this was an answer to her prayers, that we needed to leave Shanghai, come across the great waters, and interview here at BYU. Well, in her mind, in my mind, we were to get the job. Well, we came here, and we went through uh, the interview process. Um, we were told that it was going to take quite some time. Uh, I don't know if you guys know this, but to, to get hired here is quite the process now. Um, but we had received our answer. And uh, similar to the decision we had made earlier in life, when we uh, listen to the Lord and the Lord talks, um, that's pretty much all we need to know. Um, and my wife, with her great faith, she had had her answer. And so before I was hired... We went ahead and purchased a home here in Hawaii. Um, 
which was quite a big leap of faith for us, um, let alone the fact that I didn't have a job. Um, and uh, going back, you know, luckily, um, it came through that uh, I heard that the first presidency gave the university a waiver to allow them to hire me, uh, even though I wasn't uh, qualified. At least that's what I hear through the grapevine. And uh, I ended up uh, being, being hired here at, uh, at BYU-Hawaii. Um, you know, I think about all of these things in our, in our life, and, and as I was able to put this together for you guys, and these random proverbs, you know, maybe it's not so random that I'm here. Maybe there's a higher force at play in your own lives. I think all of us have been called to be here at this time in our lives. And many of you probably have similar stories and how effectual doors were opened so that you could come across these great waters and, and come here to BYU-Hawaii. I think my favorite proverb is in Proverbs, which kind of sums up how I was feeling at the time. In Proverbs 3, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. It shall be health to thy navel and marrow to thy bones. Honor thy Lord with thy substance, and with the first fruits of all thine increase, and with thy tithing, perhaps, so that thy barns be filled with a plenty, and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. This is my testimony that in my own life, when I have put my hand, put my will, and submitted to the will of the Lord, and broke out of being a frog in the well and was able to make my heart like water. I have found that the fiery darts of the adversary have not been able to cut me because of the flexibility within my heart, at least when I've been able to submit my will to the Lord. And I, I know that through my own experience, that if you as well will submit your will to the Lord in your own careers, and be flexible, and be prepared, invest in your education, and be ready for the moments when they come and the Lord blesses you, that you too will be blessed. And I leave this with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.